Lulu White was one of the most notorious madams of the 1890s and early 1900s. According to every source I have seen, she was born in Selma, Alabama in 1868, but she liked to lie about her origins. She would claim to be from Jamaica sometimes. Other times, she would claim to be from Cuba. It seems that her goal was to create an aura of exoticism about herself. And the reason? To attract wealthy white men to herself and her girls, who were her prostitutes. If they seemed like they were more than just prostitutes from New Orleans, but instead well-born, well-educated, and charming young women from exotic places, a higher price could be charged for their services. Lulu White had several run-ins with the law in her time for a multitude of things, including attempted murder and selling alcohol. But let's be very clear, she made her fortune selling sex, and she came up with some very innovative ways to do her job. Let's get into it. But first, if you like these videos about the most scandalous people from yesteryear who make the hot mess history with Ty Said What Ty Said channel a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream. And comment, I subscribed, in the comment section so that I can say hello to you. Now, on to why you are here. Lulu White was born Lulu Henley in 1868 in Selma, Alabama. Many of the details about her early years are vague, and it seems that that's the way she wanted it. When she knew that sex work was going to be her chosen path, she began a process of reinventing herself. So, rather than admit that she was from plain old Selma, Alabama, she began to tell people that she was from Jamaica or Cuba. At some point in the early 1880s, Lulu moved to New Orleans and started working as a prostitute. So, if her birth year of 1868 is correct, she could have been prostituting as early as 12 or 13 years old. She first appears in the New Orleans City Directory in 1888 in a neighborhood comprised of colored female boarding houses and brothels. She made a series of pornographic photos either in the 1880s or early 1890s, perhaps for financial gain or increased publicity or both. And by the early 1890s, she was already a madam running her own whorehouse. They say that timing is everything, and this was the case for Lulu White's success in the sex work industry. Throughout the existence of New Orleans, prostitution had been tolerated and even accepted, but at the end of the 1800s, there was a social purity movement happening in the United States that even the city of New Orleans could not escape, despite its history of being a place where one could enjoy many vices. Parts of this social purity movement included restricting and even outlawing prostitution. The man pushing the purity movement in New Orleans was Sidney Story. He was an alderman who, in 1897, introduced an ordinance to limit prostitution to a 10 square block district in the city's fourth ward. He was successful in getting his ordinance to pass bringing a semblance of conservative traditional values to his sinful city. He had to have been proud of himself. He was probably also shocked when the local New Orleans newspapers named the new red light district after him. He was Sydney Story. They called the vice district Storyville, forever attaching his name to the prostitutes he wanted to shut down. Typically, Thoughts of prostitution are accompanied by thoughts of low rent, crime, and bad neighborhoods. But the property values increased after Storyville was named a red light district because of the clientele who was to be entertained there, elite and wealthy white men. They proved to be very big spenders and they were coming from all over the country. Before this area became the red light district known as Storyville, it was a mostly black neighborhood full of working class people. 
after it became Storyville, things changed. Let's just say that gentrification is nothing new. Rents in Storyville increased as much as 1,500%, so it goes without saying that many of its previous residents had to move out. In addition to participating in the nation's purity movement at the turn of the century, New Orleans was also advertising its warm temperatures and fun activities in an attempt to get a piece of the pie of the winter tourism market, one of the potential excursions that was promoted was the city's prostitution district. Brothels in Storyville could legally only serve white men. The brothels could employ white prostitutes or black ones. However, they were required to be segregated, meaning that one house could employ either white or black prostitutes, but not both. I suppose that what Lulu White was doing was considered something in the middle. Not black prostitutes, not white prostitutes, but she only employed octoroons. I think that by today's standards, most of us would call Lulu's prostitutes white, but in the 1880s, they were distinctly classified as octoroons. And though they almost always looked white, they were not allowed to identify as such. Octoroon is a dated and offensive term which describes someone who is one-eighth black by descent, having one black great-grandparent. Again, they look white because they basically are, and these were the girls and women who Lulu employed to work in her beautiful mansion on Basin Street in Storyville. Storyville was a high-rent district, and Lulu had the money that she needed to be a major player in it. She paid $40,000 to have her brothel constructed. That $40,000 has the same buying power of about $1.4 million today in 2022. And when all was said and done, she had a four-story mansion with a swirling staircase, marble floors, 15 bedrooms, each with their own private baths, five parlors, an elevator, ornate chandeliers, luxurious furniture, and walls lined with mirrors. She named her whorehouse Mahogany Hall, a nod to the partially black women who worked there at 235 North Basin Street. Remember, Lulu had been all about selling an image since she had started lying about where she was born. Her whorehouse needed to sell an image as well. It needed to scream that she had money so that she could get even more of it from the rich men who were coming to <clears throat> visit her girls. But it didn't stop there. Of course, Lulu White had her own image to maintain and it needed to match the splendor of her mansion. She would often wear a bright red wig, a tiara, diamonds on every finger, and bracelets that went halfway up her arms. Lulu White was selling a racial fantasy to her wealthy white clients. Inherent in cultural categorizations like mulatto, quadroon, and octoroon was the assumption that though octoroon women, being the whitest of all of them, possessed the socially desirable looks of whiteness, they also inherited the savagery, depravity, and sexual desires falsely ascribed to black women. So that tiny bit of blackness is what made them exciting as sexual partners. That tiny bit of blackness is what made them taboo. That tiny bit of blackness made octoroons the epitome of sexual objects. To be in step with the entire fantasy, Lulu's house had to look the part. She had to look the part. Her girls had to look the part. And she figured that with octoroons, she couldn't lose. She named Mahogany Hall an octoroon parlor, and she was thus labeled the queen of the octoroons. She took her business very seriously. At Mahogany Hall, you didn't just come in to pick a girl and get it on. Lulu produced and published a souvenir guide that had photos and written profiles of her prostitutes. Her guidebook described Mahogany Hall as a place where a man could enjoy three shots for his money. The shot upstairs, 
the shot downstairs, and the shot in the room. Of course, Lulu is profiled in her book. Continuing with the lies about herself, she called herself a famous West Indian octoroon. She also described herself as someone who knew her business, writing, quote, it did not take long for her to find out what the other sex were in search of, end quote. Here's what she had to say about her workers. Quote, she has made a feature of boarding none but the fairest of girls, those gifted with nature's best charms and would under no circumstances have any but that class in her house, end quote. And as for the photographed use for Lulu's profile, it was apparently a picture of another one of Lulu's prostitutes who was also featured in her guidebook, Victoria Hall. So Lulu's profile was just another piece of evidence that showed how she lived her life. Some fact mixed in with some fiction. Perhaps she'd be an Instagram quote unquote model if she were alive today. Lulu produced a souvenir guidebook specifically for her brothel. But there was a well-known guide called the Blue Book that listed all of the whorehouses as well as the individual whores of Storyville. It was published annually, and it was basically like a yellow pages for prostitution. Business owners would pay the Blue Book to advertise products that its readers might want or need, like liquor, cigars, and cures for sexually transmitted diseases. Here is one of Lulu's listings in The Red Book, a publication that had basically the same information about the brothels of Storyville as The Blue Book, and it was The Blue Book's main competition. A full page for her house on the left. On the right, the numbers 235 for Lulu indicate the address. The street name is on the top of the page, so readers would know to visit 235 North Basin Street if they wanted to see Lulu or any of her girls listed there, Annie, Emma, Irene, or Corin. Like the other upscale whorehouses in Storyville, Lulu's offered more than just sex. Some of the clients wanted live entertainment, dancing, and music. And at the time when jazz music was still trying to figure out what it was, Joe King Oliver played at Mahogany Hall. He was Louis Armstrong's mentor. One thing that should be made clear about Lulu White and Octoroons of her time is that, given the opportunity to identify as just white, she would have, they would have. Lulu tried to, at least on one occasion when she visited a segregated racetrack. She was refused entry because she tried to enter as a white person. A local newspaper reported that, quote, some people take her to be colored, but she says there is not a drop of Negro blood in her veins. She says that she is West Indian and she was born in the West Indies, end quote. I wonder if Lulu had any idea just how many black people were in the West Indies when she made that statement. Anyhow, the point is that she played up the octoroon image to get money. Since she was stuck with the label, she found a way to make it pay for her pain. She turned something bad into something good. But all good things must come to an end, and Storyville is no exception to the rule. Twenty years after the red light district was established, there was mounting pressure to shut it down. Some wanted a full ban on prostitution, but until they could get that, segregation would do. In 1917, legislation was proposed to officially segregate Storyville, forcing out all non-white prostitutes. A number of madams filed lawsuits to retain their properties and won unprecedented legal victories against Jim Crow laws. The final blow against Storyville came from the U.S. Navy when, under President Woodrow Wilson's leadership, America formally entered World War I. There was a naval base in the shadows of Storyville, and anything that could possibly distract soldiers from their duty was considered a threat. That included prostitutes. A federal order prohibited prostitution within five miles of any military base. 
So it ended up being the prominent Navy presence in New Orleans, not segregationists or social purists, that ended Storyville once and for all. Well, even the United States Navy's federal order didn't stop Lulu from trying to continue her sex business as usual. She had previously beat attempted murder charges, so why not take her chance with a little prostitution? After Lulu was arrested for continuing to run her whorehouse, she received a prison sentence of one year and one day. After serving only three months of her sentence, she applied for a pardon, citing poor health, and she was pardoned by President Woodrow Wilson himself. She returned to New Orleans and immediately started running her whorehouse again. You know the saying, there's no business like hoe business. Lulu spent the late 1910s and 1920s being arrested repeatedly on charges of running a disorderly house. She was also arrested for violating the Volstead Act, which is more commonly known as the National Prohibition Act, because she was selling liquor at her saloon that was next to her brothel. Everything that she knew how to do to make money was illegal by the 1920s. So, in 1929, Lulu White sold her magnificent mansion, Mahogany Hall, to the owner of a department store, who was said to have used it for storage. The sale of Mahogany Hall was truly the end of an era, and virtually the end of Lulu White. But thanks to Louis Armstrong, whose mentor played at Mahogany Hall, the house's name was immortalized in song. His song called Mahogany Hall Stomp. Louis Armstrong himself grew up in what was called Uptown Storyville. It was nothing like the seemingly glamorous streets of Storyville where Lulu's mansion was. It was where those working class black people were forced to move when the prostitution district took over. It was also where the prostitutes of color relocated to work when segregation hit Storyville. As for Lulu White, after she sold Mahogany Hall in 1929, she tried to play it straight. She invested a good deal of her money into business dealings that turned sour. She lost over $150,000, surely almost all of her fortune, $2.5 million in today's money. In 1931, she died an ill and very poor woman. Almost all of Storyville was demolished in order to build the Iberville housing development that is more commonly called the Iberville Projects. Iberville was completed in 1941 and at the time opened exclusively for white, low-income residents. And where Mahogany Hall once stood in its four-story splendor, you will find this, Basin Supermarket Seafood and Grill. It is the first floor of Mahogany Hall's at adjacent saloon. The top story was destroyed by Hurricane Betsy in 1965. What's on the menu at this location now is nothing like what Lulu White was selling here in her day. But the good news is that now, whenever transactions are completed here, None of the guests will need a cure for a sexually transmitted disease. It was very important to Lulu White that her prostitutes were octoroons and that their skin was as white as possible. There was a group of people who called themselves the Blue Vein Society who were very vocal during Lulu's time. Proximity to whiteness was their main focus. I published a story about them that you can see here. I will also leave a link to it in the description box. My sources for this story are 64parishes.org, Caitlin V. Voicey, The Historic New Orleans Collection, New Orleans Public Library, MessyNessieChic.com, Los Latidos del Jazz.com, The Times Democrat Archives, 1898, 1909, and 1913. If you want text notifications, 
so that you can get a text 15 minutes before I release a video or 15 minutes before I live stream, simply send a text to 786-632-2135 to let me know that you want text and you will get an outgoing text message 15 minutes before I have a new video release. If you have a business, product, service, YouTube channel, or social media account that you would like to promote on my channel, email me at taiwan at taisaidwhattaisaid.com to get rates for advertising on my community tab, my live streams, and or my edited videos, just like this one. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Thai Said What Thai Said channel. Please leave a thumbs up and comment so that we can get a discussion going. And share this video on all of your social media, especially your Facebook. That really helps me out a lot. And subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know when my next video is ready for you. And if you don't like what I'm saying, but you love it, feel free to hit that applaud button just below your video screen there and send me some donations, donations, donations. Yeah, baby. See you on the next video.